Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Lovely to see so many here. A very warm welcome. This might be your first time with us. Welcome to church. Welcome here to Dundonald. We are delighted to have guests, to have friends every week. It's a special Sunday this Sunday morning because we have three Thanksgivings. The Sai family, Juliana, Noah and Joshua, are all having a Thanksgiving service this morning. And we've been waiting for many, many months to be able to do this. COVID has slowed us down, but we are here. And we're very much looking forward to praying for them and welcoming them with thanksgiving into our church family. We're conscious as we come like this, many of us will have all sorts of things on our minds, on our hearts. Some of us may feel very far from God, and yet we come because he is so kind and he is so good to welcome us. But as we come, it's good that we must remember who he is and what he's like. So let me read these words from Isaiah chapter 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you as we gather together to sing your praises and to hear your word and to encourage one another by our presence together. We ask that you would be present with us and we might know you as this God, the Holy One, the one whose glory fills the whole earth. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We come together and we declare our faith and our praise to this God with the words of the first song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. So would you please stand and the musicians will lead us.
fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. We come now to the time for a th- Thanksgiving for Juliana, for Noah, for Joshua. We have got a big Thanksgiving party with godparents and friends, so we're going to struggle to, to fill, that we'll fill up from the front. But first, Vaughn and Andrew, could I invite you to come up? Um, we would love, now many of us will know Vaughn and Angie already. They've been with us as part of our church family for a few years now, very much loved. And in the past couple of years, your family has expanded dramatically and quickly, and we've loved seeing the little ones come and grow. Um, It's a big moment to bring children for a Thanksgiving service like this publicly before this congregation to pray for them. I know that's because of your own deep Christian faith, and I would love if you would be willing to share, maybe you, Angie, first. Why is it so important for you to, to live as a Christian who follows Jesus in your life? Um, so, wow, there are lots of eyes looking at me right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, did, I wasn't born as a Christian. I met um, God in, uh, in university when I was a freshman. And it was the realization that our God is a loving Father who is someone who has authority all over us and our whole lives that, um, that really got me to believe in him. And, and also the fact that, of course, Jesus died for, to forgive my sins. And it's really special for me to, to hopefully uh, share that with our children from, to, from their birth, from their Thanksgiving today, because I know that it's God who gave them to us. It's God that is sustaining them day by day, especially at 2 in the morning when you know what happens at 2 in the morning. <laughs> And it's also God that will um, keep them for the rest of their lives. And, and uh, yeah, thank you for sharing it with us today. Thank you, Angie. You have preempted my next question a little bit. But for maybe Vaughn, you could help us. Why does it matter to you that we do this? We actually publicly give thanks to God and pray for your children in this kind of service. We've, I said we've been wanting to do this for like nearly two years in Juliana's case. We've had to keep putting it back, but you've been determined that we must do this. Why does this matter so much to you? Um, yeah, I think firstly, yeah, I think what I just wanted to share publicly is that, you know, we, we did struggle to have children for many, 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 many years, and we really fervently prayed and walked with, uh, you know, with some of the godparents, um, you know, in this journey. Um, and then when we finally have the children, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just, yeah, uh, natural for us to, you know, say thanks to God and, um, and commit you know, commit the children to, to him. Um, and then secondly, I think it's about, um, yeah, it's about, yeah, as, as parents, yeah, we'd love to be able to uh, secure their future and be, uh, and secure that future knowing that, you know, through Jesus, their, you know, their lives eternally will be secured. Um, yeah, and we'd love to be able to share, you know, heaven uh, with them um, in the future. Um, and this is the reason why we would like to do this um, and then commit them to, to Christ. Thank you, Vaughn, for sharing that, that desire to give thanks, so precious, and also to pray for them for the thing that matters most, that they would know Jesus. Um, I would like now to invite the godparents to come forward and join us on the front. And there's a chance we can all join in. The word should appear on the screen. Um, we will be giving thanks for Juliana, for Noah, for Joshua. And we as a congregation take part in this too. So there'll be some words which you can all say. I, I hope they'll appear. Um, 
These are words from Psalm 100. So we can say it together. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are the people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Almighty God, creator and sustainer of all life, we thank and praise you from the depth of our hearts for the gift of Juliana, Noah and Joshua. May we never forget or minimize your kindness to us, but serve you with thankfulness all of our lives. Amen. The Bible teaches that parents must love, discipline, provide for and raise their children in the training and instruction of the Lord, and that children should honor their parents and obey them. So to the parents and godparents, do you believe and trust in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who loved the world so much that he sent his son to die for us. I believe and trust in him. And do you believe and trust in his only son, Jesus Christ, who was crucified for our sins, rose from the dead, and is the only way of salvation? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Holy Spirit? who enables us to receive God's word, to repent and to believe the gospel. I believe and trust in him. Parents and godparents, Juliana, Noah and Joshua depend chiefly on you for the spiritual help and encouragements they need. I ask you each, therefore, are you yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, a member of a Christian church, and one who sincerely believes the promises of God? It is your duty to provide at every stage of Juliana, Noah and Joshua's growth instruction in Christian teaching. Especially you must teach them to trust in Christ alone as the way to forgiveness and salvation. Are you willing to love Juliana, Noah and Joshua, to share responsibility for their Christian upbringing, to teach them the gospel and to pray for them regularly? Let us therefore ask for God's help that Juliana, Noah and Joshua may be nurtured as God has commanded. This is a prayer the whole congregation can join in with. Father God, you sent your son to be born and grow up in the care of a family. Grant, we pray, that Juliana, Noah and Joshua may grow strong, healthy and happy in the care of their family. Grant to Juliana, Noah, and Joshua's parents the wisdom, understanding, patience, and strength they need, and bless their home with the light of your truth and the warmth of your love through knowing Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Teach their parents and godparents faithfully to pray for them and to teach them the truth about you. May we support them and share in this precious work so that in your great mercy, Juliana, Noah and Joshua might find in Christ the joy of salvation and the freedom of living in your family. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible teaches that when Jesus tried to prevent young children from coming to him, he was furious and said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. And he put his arms around them, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. So now is a chance for us as a church family to welcome Juliana, Noah, and Joshua into our church family. So please do say together. We welcome Juliana, Noah and Joshua into this congregation 
We pray that they will never be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified, that they will fight bravely for this faith against sin, the world, and the devil, and that they will become and continue to be obedient children of God to the end of their lives. Amen. Why don't we give them a loud, warm applause, welcoming them into our church family. And just to say, we know there are many family and friends overseas, the Sai family, the Natividad family, who weren't able to be with us. So we want to welcome you and thank you for your love and your care. And we very much hope you'll be able to join us in person one time soon. Let me pray now for these children and for all the children as they head off to their groups. Lord God, we praise you again for the gift of life. Every single precious life is a gift from you. We thank you especially this day for Juliana, Noah and Joshua the gift they are to their parents, the gift they are to us as a church family. And we ask, as we have just prayed, that you would be the one who leads and cares for them through the love and encouragement of their parents and us as a whole church family, so that they might grow up to be strong in faith and live to serve the Lord Jesus Christ every day. And we pray for all our children now as they head off to their groups. We ask that they might also grow in their love and their knowledge of Jesus, that they too might live all out for him in the days and the years ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Now it's a chance for the children and young people to head out to their groups. It will be hectic for a couple of minutes. Um, mini movers, that's six months to three, three years, are through in the canteen. Everybody older is through that way and the stewards will show you where you need to go. I'm sorry to interrupt there. We will, res we will resume our service. So if you're able to find a seat. We're now coming, we're coming back together for a time of prayer. And Moira Kirkpatrick is going to lead us in our prayers. Our prayers this morning are based on the Lord's Prayer, which Jesus taught his disciples as a model for prayer, and we will say it together at the end of the prayers. So let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. As we study the Apostles' Creed in our growth groups this term, we marvel that through the saving grace of our Lord Jesus, we are adopted into your family and that we can call you the almighty Lord who created all things, our Father. Thank you for Von and Angie Sai for all they do as part of our church family. Thank you for Juliana, Noah and Joshua and for the joy they bring to Von and Angie. As they grow up, may they love and follow the Lord Jesus and always know you as their heavenly Father. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for the servants of the Word Bible School in the Gambia, whose work we support as a church. We pray for good treatment and quick recovery of the school's director, Stephen Musakomea, who has been unwell for some months and has not been able to teach this term, and for the staff team, Adriano, Daniel, Nick and Sabino, as they share the extra workload. Only two full-time students have enrolled so far, with another delayed by the coup in Guinea Conakry. We pray that more may join and that you would raise up a new generation of faithful Bible teachers. Thank you for the encouragement of former students now in ministry. Matthias setting up discipleship training in Liberia, Timothy church planting in Guinea Conakry, and Charles serving as a pastor in Gunjur. We pray that you would strengthen them and equip them to be faithful servants of the word. 
Give us today our daily bread. We pray for all those experiencing acute poverty, whether ongoing or as a result of the impact of coronavirus, particularly with the end of the furlough scheme and the additional support through universal credit. We pray that they may have the courage to reach out for support where it is needed and for timely access to the right benefits and for new employment opportunities for those in a position to work. We pray for the work of the food banks, particularly thinking of Wimbledon Food Bank. We give thanks for the dedication and compassion of those running and volunteering to help with the food banks. Please give them the wisdom and clarity in decision-making that results in the best support for people in crisis. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we see the news, we are all too aware that we live in a fallen world. Each day brings reports of sickness, conflict, violence, greed and selfishness. We grieve for the families and friends of Sarah Everard, Sabina Nessa and others who are the victims of violent crime. Please, Father, draw close to them and comfort them. We know too, Father, that we fall short of how you would wish us to behave. Thank you for sending your Son into the world to take the punishment that we deserve. Please grant us lives that seek to serve and glorify your name. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we will now say together the Lord's Prayer, the words of which are on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hey church family, we might not be in the new building yet, but we've still got lots of opportunities to be equipped to go and tell the gospel and to invite people to come and see something of Jesus. So let me tell you about what's coming up later on this term for those things. Coming up, uh, you can see on this card that you've got in your seats, we've got an evangelism reboot session on Thursday the 14th of October, 7.30 kickoff at Wimbledon Chase Costa. We're going to be having one evening dedicated to thinking about how we can be equipped to go and tell the gospel. We'll have a panel discussion, we'll have some Q&A, um, a bit of time to work through some top tips on how we might go and tell the gospel. This is for everybody in the church family uh, who'd like to come along and have a bit of an evangelism reboot Thursday the 14th of October 7.30 in Wimbledon Chase Costa. And then coming up later on in the term, just a couple of things to be inviting people to come and see something of Jesus. Um, as a really soft option, we've got a big quiz on Saturday the 6th of November, backed by popular demand. We haven't run one of these in ages. The Evangelised team are putting this on. Uh, we're going to be doing it at St Andrews. Invite your friends um, for, to come for a really fun Saturday evening, uh, gathered together, having a pub quiz, and hearing a couple of interviews and testimonies about people's own experience of coming to see Jesus. Um, so that's the 6th of November. And then on the 7th of November, that following Sunday, we've got a guest Sunday across the day. In the daytime, we're going to be looking at the story of the lost son. Uh, and in the evening, we're going to be looking at the miracle of the blind man seeing two wonderful opportunities to invite people to come to church and to, again to hear some stories. We've got some, some baptisms going on that day too. Um, chance to, to hear people's testimonies of coming to faith. That'll be a great day to be inviting people along to church on the 7th of November. And then, as usual, that is followed by something better starting on Thursday, the 11th of November, again at Wimbledon Chase Costa Coffee, 
Bring your friends, four evenings exploring humanity's pursuit of meaning, satisfaction, identity and hope, and a chance to discover how Jesus holds out the offer of something better. So that's what's coming up this term. Some stuff to equip us to go and tell, some things to invite people to come and see. Take that card away with you, stick it on your fridge so you know what's coming up. And then if you want to invite people to stuff, grab one of these cards on your way out, double-sided, that tells you about the quiz and the guest Sunday. You could give that to a friend or a neighbor or a colleague and say, come along. Um, grab a bundle of these uh, and, and invite people with those cards. All right. That's terrific. So we've got these ones on your chairs. We've got the other ones to take and give on the way out. Please take them. We can get loads more made. So we want, we want to be giving very generously and widely. We're going to come now to hearing God's word read. We're continuing our series in Luke's gospel and Fabi's going to come and give us our reading. We'll be reading from Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48, uh, which you'll find on page 1045 in the Church Bibles, or please open your Bible app. That's Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself, ready, himself to serve, will make them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master's taking a long time in coming, and he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign, assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does, does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Thank you very, very much. Just a bit of a reminder for, for regulars that our prayer and vision evening this Wednesday. And um, I know there's loads of people already signed up, but if you haven't signed up, don't forget because obviously the caterers need to, to know by tomorrow lunchtime. So do sign up online for the prayer and vision evening this Wednesday evening. Um, and if you can't, just turn up anyway. We want everyone to be there. It should be a wonderful, wonderful evening, uh, our prayer and vision evening this Wednesday. Let's bow our heads and pray as we start. <clears throat> Almighty God, again we thank you that your Holy Spirit speaks to us today through your word, the Bible. And so we pray, please, whether we're familiar with these things or very new to them, help us now to concentrate and help us to understand what you're saying here and to understand what this means for our lives right here in London. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 
Well, we're continuing our uh, daytime series looking at Jesus' parables in Luke, which complements our evening series looking at Jesus' miracles in Luke. Actually, a growing number of people are coming to church both morning and evening in order to enjoy uh, both, which is obviously great. Today we come to another profoundly disturbing parable about thieves in the night and a servant being cut to pieces. Which reminds us, as Jesus has previously explained, he didn't tell parables to entertain us with soothing, childish bedtime stories about a hungry caterpillar. He told parables to provoke us to think with confusing and alarming tales about serious eternal issues. Indeed, to call the humble and to judge the proud who won't come to him for further teaching. And today's parable poses us two big questions. Firstly, who? Who are we living for? Some, of course, are living for the approval of their parents or for their partners or their children. Some for the approval of their employers or their friends. <clears throat> and of course, many live for themselves. In this parable, Jesus is quite clear that his followers must live for him as his obedient servants. This is no casual commitment or weekend hobby. hobby. He calls us to radical personal devotion to him. But also it poses the question, when are we living for? I mean, of course, many are living for the Wimbledon dream, you know, a huge pile by the park with a glamorous partner and impressive kids. And many are just trying to survive, hoping to enjoy some grandchildren in retirement, and others of us are just living for now, trying not to think about the future, rather like the fool in Jesus' parable last week, saying, take life easy, eat, drink, me merry. Let's not think about the future just yet. But in this parable, after telling his disciples to seek eternal, his eternal kingdom and to invest in heavenly treasures, Jesus calls his disciples to live for the day he returns. The day that's proclaimed in the gospel, which is carved into the foundation stone of our new building, which one day we hope to inhabit. Jesus is Christ our Lord, who came as our King, died for our sins, rose to rule, and will return to judge and renew all things. As Paul puts it in Romans 1, the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. We've said before that knowing God in Jesus is wonderful now, but the difference between following him and ignoring him isn't as obvious now as it will be one day in the future, when the difference will be as wide as the difference between the horrors of hell and the happiness of heaven. Jesus is saying, live for my return. Now, amongst Bible-loving Christians, <clears throat> the pendulum keeps swinging from one side and then to the other, on whether we're living for now, or whether we're living for when Jesus comes back. Um, certainly when I was uh, younger, um, which was centuries ago, we were taught that life as a Christian was a bit like the old mill in the village of Chudley in Devon. And on the front of the mill, there's the sign that says, workroom downstairs, showroom upstairs. And that was pretty much our view of the Christian life. Uh, since then, there's been more of an emphasis upon enjoying our relationship with God now, and it's wonderful to know God through Jesus. But the primary biblical images of the Christian life do emphasize the future. For example, the Exodus redemption from slavery in the Old Testament, modelling how we as Christians are rescued from the slavery to sin to journey through the wilderness to the promised land. Or as in so many images in the New Testament, such as this one here, of servants in a great household awaiting the return of their master. The emphasis really is upon living by faith in God's gospel promise. It's good now, but it will be wonderful then. Now, to try and help with this, I, some of you will know, I wrote a book recently called uh, Faith for Life, which looks like this. Um, I don't get the royalties, so I can recommend it to you. Um, it's about um, the ordinary heroes of Hebrews chapter 11. And it emphasises living here in London for the future that God is bringing. I want to recommend it uh, to you. 
If we follow Jesus, you see, we will have to carry our cross now if we want to wear a crown then. And to promise too much now will lead to disillusionment, and it's not kind. I was visiting with a family yesterday with a a child struggling with mental illness and uh, just uh, questioning, discussing together, why is life so hard for us now? You know, we're just discussing in your 20s, you feel invincible. You know, in your 30s, you might become the power couple. By the time you hit your 40s, things start going wrong. And by the time you're 50s, you're surrounded by pain. It's just reality of living in a broken world. And to promise too much is cruel when God has promised us so much when Jesus returns. I don't know whether you've you've noticed how car adverts have become many sermons in woke ideology. Have you noticed that? It uh, struck me yesterday, I was watching the advert for the new fully electric Audi Q4. The advert doesn't actually mention the car at all, but it does offer the following wisdom. We define who we are and how we want to lead our lives. Basically, we choose what we want our future to look like. So what's yours going to be? Here endeth the sermon. What a dangerous fantasy that is. And what a damaging burden it's proving for our children. We are not defining ourselves or choosing our future. Audi should stick to selling cars. We don't define ourselves except in our dreams. And we won't choose our future either. In this parable, Jesus explains that he will choose where we go for eternity. Which is, if you didn't know, a very, very, very long time. And so Jesus says, you need to prepare for my return. Jesus' parable uses the powerful analogy of a landowner employing many servants to manage his estate. It's vital to know, especially if our own personal or cultural background involves the horrors of the slave trade or or of human trafficking. Jesus is never supportive of slavery. He's simply describing the familiar reality of a well-run household of his time including many servants. In his story, he illustrates two priceless principles. And first is this. Live for Jesus like watchful servants, ready for their master's return. The story is making three observations. Firstly, the master wants us to prepare for his return. Look with me at verse 35. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Uh, Being dressed ready for service is literally girding up your loins, that is, tucking up the long robes that people wore uh, in uh, Israel in the first century, ready for hard work. Or as we would say, roll up your sleeves, ready to work for the master. Jesus wasn't naively suggesting he thought his return was imminent. Wedding celebrations in Jesus' day often lasted a few days and sometimes went on as long as a week. So Jesus was deliberately suggesting a long and frustrating delay. And he's not telling us, as some have clumsily suggested, that, to live as, that we must live as if Jesus is coming back uh, tomorrow afternoon. Or let's face it, uh, we wouldn't bother with work and uh, we just down tools and ring up uh, all our friends and, and spout as much gospel as we can. Although that's not a bad idea in itself. But when Tuesday comes, uh, we'll have to change plans. He's not saying that. He's saying that we need to be doing the things that the Master wants us to be doing so that whenever Jesus does return, whether that's during our lives or after we've died, he'll be pleased with how we've lived. Notice Jesus describes his servants as busy for him. They're not asleep. They're not meditating. They're not partying. They're not building their own kingdoms. They're busy for him. In other words, Jesus is openly commending a life actively committed to growing his kingdom, which is through making disciples of all nations, whether here in Rains Park or around the world, which is through teaching the gospel of the king, who calls people to live under his rule as king, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. So we have to get clear that it's very different to our culture. It's not what we earn or own that will impress Jesus. He really doesn't care 
how much we take home each month. He really doesn't care how big our house is. It's the hard work of prayerful, patient and relentless investment in his mission, in evangelising the world that matters most to him. Now we all have different roles in that. Some of us will pray, some of us will invite, some of us will speak. But Thomas has outlined some pretty obvious ways to be involved in that. The evangelism reboot, 14th of October, most of us need help with that. The big pub quiz on the 6th of November, and then the guest Sunday services the following day. And then there's the something better course after that. Lots of opportunities to get involved. This is what Jesus wants to find us pursuing, not building our own little sandcastles. I mean, so many of us are busy trying to build the biggest sandcastle. As long as it's bigger than his sandcastle and her sandcastle, and then, of course, when the sea comes, it'll just wipe the whole lot away. We can't take any of it with us. He says, now invest in my heavenly kingdom because I am coming back. And wonderfully, he says, the master will honour us if we're ready. Look at verse 37. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. When you think about it, this is truly astonishing. If we're dressed to serve him during our lives, he promises he will dress to serve us in eternity. At the great victory state banquet, his banquet. Can you imagine him leaving his throne and putting on an apron and coming to serve us, asking us what we'd like for the next course? He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He wants to, to demonstrate his personal, public, everlasting gratitude to anybody who will serve him as so many in this hall are doing. What a wonderful incentive to look for opportunities to serve Jesus in his household. Like watchmen who stay alert even in the sleepiest watches of the night when everybody else is relaxing and we're committed. Now of course I'm not saying, the wrong, we're not, we all need physical and emotional refreshment. In a busy place like London, lots of us, we, we need lots of that. We're created beings and we need to rest. But spiritually, we don't rest from serving Jesus until we get to heaven. The servants of Jesus will never retire to the pool or the golf course, but are living for his respect, living for the day that he returns, living for his approval. For surely the master will come when we don't expect him, verse 39. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he'd not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready. Because the Son of Man, that is the title he uses for himself, the title in Daniel 7 given to the one who will judge the living and the dead, the powerful one to whom the Ancient of Days gives all authority and power as he has now given to Jesus. The Son of Man will come at an hour when you don't expect him. Jesus repeatedly compares the unpredictability of his coming to a thief breaking in during the night. It's not just that Jesus didn't, didn't know the date when he will come, although he does say that his Father will decide that, but presumably because his judgment is a continual assessment and not exam cramming. I, I don't know where you are on this. Uh, some people you know, work steadily throughout the year and get great grades. Other people like me don't do any work until three weeks beforehand and then you, you know what you do. You cram night and day, take some drugs, stay, stay up late and pass the exam. And you know, I, I just can't study for longer than that. Um, but Jesus is saying, you've got to get used to it. I'm interested in how you live your whole life. You can't cram in the last few days for Jesus' return. Now we long for uh, Jesus to return to end the suffering of this broken world and the terrible persecution of his people. But God has told us that he's delaying the end of the world to give more people the opportunity to be saved, 1 Peter 3. I don't know how he will decide when it's time. But when he comes, it'll be more like an Ofsted inspection. You know an Ofsted inspection in schools? 
You, you, you know how um, the idea is that the Ofsted inspectors come and they only give a day's warning. They, they don't give you any time to prepare. Although teachers, of course, stay up very late through the night, don't they? T you know, sticking up all kinds of colourful pictures to try and make the classroom look pretty for the following day and just hope the children don't say, oh, where do all these lovely pictures come from? But that's, you know, <laughs> if you are a teacher, I know, we all know what you do, but... Um, Jesus is saying, look, you won't know when I'm coming back. It'll be when you least expect me. So when some crackpot announces the end of the world, you know it's not then. Unless God is double bluffing. Anyway, you can't predict when Jesus will come back. So while it's right to preserve our planet by reducing carbon emissions and preventing nuclear conflict and addressing world poverty, nevertheless, Jesus will come when he thinks it's right and without warning like a thief in the night. I don't know whether you've ever been broken to, into. I remember the, the shock when we arrived back from holiday once to find our house broken into and the police officers were very kind to us and they sat us down and they realised it's quite shocking. Actually, they didn't take much because there's not much in our house they wanted. <laughs> um, but it's still very intrusive, isn't it? Shocking to think someone's been rummaging around in the house and, and looking at everything. He will come when we don't expect him. So one day, I don't know when it is, maybe it's this week, more probably I guess when we die and are then awoken to find that the Lord and his angels are filling the skies, we will face Christ's personal judgment and each of us in turn will stand before the risen Lord Jesus and give an account of our lives. Now I don't know whether we're Strictly Come Dancing fans or Australian MasterChef fans, uh, we're the, the second. Watching people desperately trying to impress the judges. I was trying to think, what is the more familiar experience for us in our daily lives of having to prepare for seeing someone? And I was thinking actually, sorry to mention it, but probably dental hygiene is about the closest thing uh, that we experience. We know that we must face the dentist one day and he will declare his judgment upon our teeth. <laughs> and we know that we have to try and kind of prepare for that terrible day and try and manage what we eat and to brush and floss and avoid sweets and so on. And we know that it doesn't have to be horrible. Um, the treasurer at our church, Stephen Hathwell, was telling me on the phone how delighted he was. It was like he'd been given a, an OBE or something. He'd been to the dentist and the dentist had complimented him on his flossing. And, and you know how excited he could be. But of course, we also know how terrible it would be. And he was telling me about his wife having a tooth removed who was in agony. If we don't watch what we eat and drink, we will face, you know, the noise. You know that noise? Can't quite do it. Jesus says, look, much more seriously than the dentist. I will come back to judge the living and the dead. And very kindly, he's warning us and saying, you need to be ready so that whenever I come, you're serving me as I want you to be and don't regret it forever. Well, Peter now asks a question. And so Jesus varies the story. Secondly, and lastly, Jesus says, live for Jesus like faithful managers responsible for their master's business. Look at verse 41. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Peter is characteristically speaking up for the disciples and he's eager to clarify who exactly Jesus is warning, probably hoping that he and his friends don't need to feel threatened. Uh, it's them, all the other crowds, Lord, Lord, you're not telling this to us, are you? You're telling it to them, aren't you? It's them that need to hear this. It's not obvious exactly who Peter is referring to here. When he says us, does he mean all the disciples in general? So when he says everyone, he means unbelievers, the crowd out there. Or when he says us, does he mean us, the chosen apostles? So when he says everyone, he means the other disciples. So which is it? I think that since in chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 22, the audience is said to be the disciples, and until after this passage in verse 54, when it changes to the crowd, presumably the us here is all the disciples, and everyone else includes unbelievers. 
So Peter's asking to know how far does judgment, Jesus' judgment extend? And so Jesus now tells a story specifically for Peter about the stewards in his household, the managers of his servants. In verse 46, the selfish steward is consigned to the unbelievers, which is clearly meant to be a shock. So Jesus appears to be describing leaders in his church, those given responsibility for others in his household who prove unfaithful. So if the first parable was about judgment of all humanity, he's now warning those appointed to responsibility in his household, and he reveals what really inflames his wrath. The master has entrusted us with great responsibility, verse 41. Sorry, this is 41 to 44. The Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. This picture of faithful and wise stewards appointed to serve the other servants most obviously applies to those appointed to feed and care for his people spiritually. He's not using titles, he's describing ministries, and so this would include all who lead small groups or teach our children and youth, but of course especially our pastors. Notice Jesus describes their duties as giving the other servants their food allowance at the proper time, reminding leaders to give Jesus' servants what he wants for them, a steady diet of God's word. Jesus says it'll be good for the managers who serve well. Or as Peter puts it, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This is so encouraging for so many of us here and across our church and, and elsewhere who are trying to serve Jesus by feeding his people with the word of God. What a wonderful encouragement for you, if that is you, that you will be personally honoured by the living Lord Jesus Christ. And when you're labouring away late into the evening at your Bible studies, trying to pray for the members of your group and you're exhausted, and when people are troublesome and difficult, but you're trying to be patient because you love them out of love for the Lord Jesus, how wonderful to know that in eternity you will be honoured for the sacrifices that you are making for other people in, in Jesus' household. Jesus says it will be good for you to have served him well. But he's extremely severe here with leaders who misuse their power and abuse his servants. The master will punish those who mistreat his servants. Look at verse 45. But suppose the servant says to himself, oh, my master's taking a long time coming. And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he doesn't expect him, and at an hour he's not aware of, he will cut him to pieces, literally dismember him, and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Here Jesus is describing how leaders who abuse his trust and mistreat his servants prove that they were never his real servants at all. Now there have been many tragic revelations in recent months of immoral and abusive leaders amongst evangelical churches. And Jesus identifies here a major reason that leaders become like that is forgetting his return to judge. And so they mistreat his servants and indulge themselves. I've written about this, I've suggested five scriptural principles for servant-hearted leadership in a piece that's available on the Dundonna website from our, in our safeguarding statement. Just to remind you of five simple principles here that pastors must serve, not exploit. For Jesus said, you know those regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant. Secondly, pastors must be gentle and not dominating. 1 Peter 5. Peter writes, Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them. He goes on, Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. 
Thirdly, pastors must apply God's word and not their own opinions. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, preach the word. Next, pastors must apply, sorry, pastors must be respected but not protected. 1 Timothy 5, Paul does say the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honour, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. It's right to honour those who serve us well. But fifthly, pastors must be assessed and not unaccountable. There are mischievous accusations. 1 Timothy 5 says, don't entertain an accusation against an elder unless unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you're to reprove before everyone so that others may take warning. To summarise, we want to encourage and to pray for leaders who are Christ-like. That is Bible-shaped, cross-inspired, spirit-empowered, servant-hearted, leading by example from the front, not pushing with coercion from behind. On Monday evening at our commission partnership uh, evening for senior pastors and elders, uh, Andy Mason offered um, a wonderful, some wonderful insights into why it is that church leaders do fail. And for, for many of us here in church, this is important for us. Just quickly, he mentioned these things. A failure to rejoice in Christ in the midst of the discouragements of ministry. Secondly, a failure to daily repent so that small sins become big sins through repetition, which sears our consciences. We think it doesn't matter. Thirdly, a failure to submit to others if we become isolated or too intimidating to call out. A failure to worship if we're activists like Martha who need to sit at Jesus' feet like Mary. A failure to tremble before the holiness of God and his word. A failure of spiritual disciplines if we're only acting close to God and we're not actually close to God. A failure of servant-heartedness if we exalt ourselves to feed our narcissistic need for approval. And finally, a failure, failure of leadership culture to provide loving support with accountability so that leaders can't get away with bullying. These are things not just for the elders to enforce, and our elders are very, very aware, aware both of the failings and are in an ongoing process of trying to ensure that our leadership is servant-hearted. But it's also something for us all to pray for in our pastors and teachers and leaders across the church because clearly Jesus takes the abuse of his people extremely seriously. And so the master will be most severe with those entrusted with much. Look at verse 47. The servant who knows the master's will and doesn't get ready or doesn't do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who doesn't know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. Now this is really interesting because Jesus is clear here that God's justice is discerning. His his justice is not wooden. He takes into account the increased guilt that comes with increased knowledge of God. And I think this has a double application, firstly to unbelievers. Paul explains in Romans 1 that every human being is aware of the existence of the living God from creation, and so everyone is guilty of rebelliously suppressing our knowledge of him. In other words, everyone who has rejected God will sadly head for hell. Uh, Even if we worship human versions of God, whether those are inherited from the religions of our culture, like Buddhism or Islam, or invented by popular imagination of the, I like to think of God as an inner force kind of variety. But Jesus is clear that those who've heard his teaching will be additionally guilty. For example, he said in Matthew 11, Woe to you, Chorazin, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida which were both towns where he'd been preaching and and healing. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, that is pagan towns, they would would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Which does suggest that God's punishment in hell will be just and therefore even more severe for those who've heard a lot from Jesus than for those who've rejected him, rejected God, but have never heard the gospel. But also for believers, James writes, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly, James 3.1. So 
So when Jesus says here, for the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be expected, I wonder if some of us need to face the reality that we've been privileged to hear fine teaching for many, many years and that we need to step up and to offer more. For those to whom much has been entrusted, from them much will be expected by Jesus. So as we conclude, a sobering question for us all. What needs to change? What needs to change? I don't know about you, but it's hard to remember the future. You know, we're all caught up and distracted by life. But I want to suggest that even if we're more at the more spontaneous, passionate, chaotic end of the spectrum than the wise, steady, responsible planning end of the spectrum, there are changes we can make. There's no suggestion in the, in, the, in the Bible that to be a Christian, you have to be a sort of steady plodder and that the um, sort of chaotic, excitable amongst us can't be saved. Uh, you know, we're all invited to salvation. In other words, some of us will need to sit down and prayerfully plan the rest of our lives. Others of us may need to make some passionate, chaotic, spontaneous decisions, perhaps even today and right now. I'm going to do this differently. But change the direction of our life to change our life's ambition, instead of all about exalting me, to be all about exalting Jesus. To offer our time, our money, our gifts, to step up to serve in a ministry team of some kind. No longer spectators, but players on the pitch. I've said before, I don't really mind what position you play in the team. We've all got different gifts and different ministries, but don't be a spectator watching everybody else get busy. Get on the pitch. Do what you can as the person you are for the Lord you love. Most of us manage to to save or to diet a bit or train occasionally or study a bit or recycle a bit or even to run a marathon, as many are doing today. And we do those things for a better future. Frankly, it's very temporary. Jesus says, get your eternity sorted out. Live for my return like watchful and faithful servants who are ready for my return and active in my mission. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Let me give you a moment of quiet for you to speak to the living Lord Jesus yourself in the quietness of your own heart and perhaps make some resolutions before him today. Living Lord Jesus Christ, please have mercy upon us. Please forgive us where we have lived for ourselves and for now. And have lived, frankly, as if you weren't coming back. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help all of us, young or old, to live in the light of your return, like watchful and faithful servants, ready for your return, active in your mission. Please help us even now to see what we could do in the coming week to commit ourselves to your kingdom instead of building our own stone castles. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. We're going to sing together now and respond to God in what we've heard from him, from his word, and think of that day, the day of the Lord Jesus' return. So please stand and we'll sing together. Day of one.
gracious Savior, not just there as just alone. When all earth and heaven melts away, gracious Savior, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for the power and truth and goodness of your word that you give us all that we need to be ready now. And we pray that we would be those who've heard you and who resolve to live lives that are ready and watching and waiting and serving and doing good about your business until you return. And we thank you for that amazing promise of reward, of blessing, of your good pleasure with those who serve you faithfully now. And we pray that you'd strengthen us to be those. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Please do be seated. And as we head off, a couple of quick reminders. Still not too late to book on to the Vision and Prayer Wednesday evening. Um, and do stick around to greet and share our love and appreciation with the Sai family after this wonderful Thanksgiving service. And don't forget to collect your children from the groups. We will hope to see you soon.